Saludos. Yep, it's your host, Gabe Morales, back for another segment on Chicago Games. The group I'm going to talk about today is well documented, and a big reason for that was my co author, Joe Sparks. While Joe worked all kinds of games during his career at Chicago Police Department, he was specifically assigned to work Maniac Latin Disciples for a good chunk of his time in the gang unit. He worked many cases on MLDs and arrested several of the individuals I'm about to speak on. And yes, you may remember him from his expert interviews on the TV show Gangland. The Maniac Latin Disciples' history goes back to the mid-1960s when many Blacks were joining disciple gangs. Some Latinos wanted to be disciples too, but still represent their culture. Devil's Disciples and Black Disciples and other disciples attended Wills High School and other schools in the area. Latino youth from West Town also attended the same high school, which is located on the borders of Ukrainian Village, East Humboldt Park, and Wicker Park. Young Puerto Ricans, in particular, from Rockwell and Potomac and East Humboldt Park, became heavily influenced by the disciples. The gang that would eventually become the Latin Disciples actually started out as 12 guys on the baseball team, led by Victor Gonzalez. Soon, Albert Hitler Hernandez turned the baseball team into Latin Disciples. They also took over the Latin Scorpions clubhouse, and their original emblem was a cross. The monk, swastika, heart, devil's horn, and devil's tail associated with them today did not come until later. Eventually, as all gangs rep colors, the Latin disciples chose black and light blue to represent. These teens in East Humboldt Park had some problems with white greaser gangs like C-Notes, Gay Lords, PVPs, and others. Some of them had family members that were in the Milwaukee Kings and Latin Kings and various other gangs. So at first, they had no beef with Puerto Rican gangs. But these kids didn't want to join the nearby Kings and decided to create a Latin Disciple Gang in 1966. And Albert Hernandez was one of their leaders and creators of the original group. A second group was called the Bruce Lee Latin Disciples, led by Pete the Burner Correa. Bruce Lee was becoming real big in the martial arts arena and many kids wanted to be able to kick ass like him, so they took on his name. There was also Jose Freckles Sedeno, who led the Almighty Latin Disciples. So in the beginning, there were actually three different Latin Disciple factions in the area. Freckles' mother owned a corner store on Rockwell and Potomac named Santa's Store, and the family lived on the first floor, while Jose himself lived on the second floor with his girlfriend, Ana. Edwin Mousy Barrios moved into the third floor and was also a big-time Latin Disciple. Eventually, these Latin Disciples would have conflicts with Latin Kings, Warlords, and Spanish Lords. Milwaukee Kings and Latin Kings were enemies, and Latin Disciples decided to hang out with the Milwaukee Kings, who became their closest allies, and the two clubs often partied together. It was common for youth in the late 1950s and 1960s to do community work as public relations measures. So Latin Disciples often helped out the community at Rockwell and Potomac, by doing things like neighborhood cleanups and food drives. The disciples treated many people in the community with respect and would even stick up for them if they were being bullied by neighborhood gangs. It was during the ferocious blizzard of 1967 that the Latin disciples volunteered to shovel snow for people in the community. This act even got Albert Hernandez and his disciples pictured in the Chicago Daily News, which is a photo that was used for the History's Gangland Show. Hernandez was almost 13 years old in this photo. In the late 1960s, the Latin disciples got close to the Spanish Cobras as they moved into Maplewood and Division, as discussed on the Cobras episode. But this would eventually evolve into one of the most bitter rivalries in Chicago street gang history. In 1968, Latin disciples opened the door to more recruitment 
as it began taking in blacks, Mexicans, Polish, Germans, and others, not just Puerto Ricans. Albert Hernandez was very charismatic and was able to convince many local youths to join his group. Soon, the Latin disciples would number over 100 members. It was at this time when Hernandez called for unity between the various Latin disciples, the Almighty Latin disciples, and the Bruce Lee disciples to create one nation to be known as, as just the Latin disciples. Albert Hernandez was then appointed as leader of the gang, and he was regarded as being the king. Some say Hernandez was a big reader of Adolf Hitler literature because he admired the dictator's rise to power. And yes, many find it curious that a Latino would admire somebody who promoted putting people who look just like him to death. But I don't think it was the racist part of Hitler that he would have been attracted to. It was probably just him admiring Hitler's ability to organize and expand his territory as Hernandez wanted to do the same thing. Others say that Hernandez had no interest in the dictator and that this story was just made up after his death to make him look like the ruler of the disciples. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me either. On the day of January 18, 1972, Hernandez was out at Rockwell and Potomac in his turf when some Latin kings came into the neighborhood. Now, some say they were harassing one of the Polish members of the Latin disciples and that Hernandez stood up for his homeboy when one of the Latin kings pulled out a knife and stabbed him to death. But Joe Parks told me that even though the Latin disciples blamed the kings for Hernandez's death, the kings said it was the c notes who actually killed him. He also told me a slightly different version that led to Hernandez's death. As a way of showing respect, when you walked through rival gang's territory, it was common that you took off your gang sweater and placed it over your arm so you were not flying your colors. One day, two Latin kings were walking by Rockwell Potomac which was the motherland for the Latin disciples, and they refused to take their sweaters off. Hernandez confronted them about it. A fight broke out, and that is when he was stabbed to death. I tend to believe Joe's story personally, as he interviewed many of the older Latin disciples. Albert Hernandez was killed just a few months before he would have been 18 years old, and this much is certain. After his death, he was known in gang folklore as King Hitler. A lot of people don't know, but the swastika was at first considered a, a good Hindu religious symbol. It only had negative connotations after Adolf Hitler's reign. The Latin disciples ran Rockwell and Potomac from 1966 to 72. There was no Hirsch in Rockwell or any Hirsch in Potomac, now called the Twilight Zone, at that time. Members of the Latin disciples and Milwaukee Kings got revenge for the killing of Hernandez. The streets knew who did it, and it said that revenge was given to a Latin king but it is totally possible that the Sinos did it, or maybe the kings were just trying to throw the heat off themselves. As far as I and Joe know, though, police never solved that murder. Irregardless, the Latin disciples launched a full-scale war on the Latin kings by their new leader, Prince Diablo. After King Hitler died, Latin disciples decided that they would never have another king, and from that point on forward, their leader would be referred to as just a prince. Prince Diablo was said to be the first to carry this title, and he was in charge until the late 1970s. Many of the original Latin disciples left the game after Hernandez was killed, and the vast majority were gone by the late 1970s, when drug sales started to become a huge part of gang activities. After King Hitler passed, the Latin disciples spread to the West Humboldt Park in neighborhood, where they conflicted with more Latin kings and Simon Sitter royals who operated in that area. As I stated in the Cobras episode, Spanish cobras and Latin disciples were tight in the early days. This led some disciples and cobras to call themselves Almighty in the early 1970s. The Latin lovers were also Almighty when they formed in 1973. But all of this was very short-lived when the disciples started the Maniac concept in 1973. Joe Sparks told me it was in that year that Pete the Burner Correa was arrested, and during his trial, he cussed out the judge, and supposedly when being sentenced, told the judge, give me whatever you want. I'm a maniac. Well, ever since that incident, maniac was added to their name. The Maniac Latin Disciples created a structure whereby very young members would start out as peewees, then become young Latin Disciples. Next, they would become young future Latin Disciples, and after that, it was future Latin Disciples, until they reached the final title to become a true, full-fledged Maniac Latin Disciple. The violence between Latin kings and Latin disciples led to the incarceration of many Latin disciples in the 1970s, including the co-founder, Rudy Rios, who found himself in prison by 1974. In 1976, the Latin disciples and Spanish cobras formed an alliance called the Young Latino Organization, or YLO. Then, 
1978, the unity was expanded to include Imperial Gangsters and Latin Eagles to form the United Latino Organization, or ULO. And they did reach out to some other clubs to join them, like Orchestra Album. Marijuana has always been a staple drug in the ghettos and barrios, but in the late 1970s, the disco scene was real big, as was snorted powdered cocaine. But many of the Latino and Black kids couldn't afford it. This is when smoke crack cocaine came out. As drug sales grew and money stashes piled up, so did ripoffs. So the gangsters needed guns to protect drug profits as well as their gang turf. This battle of dealers and gangs only increased throughout the 1980s and 1990s. Joe Sparks advised me that the maniac Latin disciples and the gangster disciples were real close from the early days. And he once had a high-ranking MLD confidential informant tell him once that they had a meeting with Gator Bradley, who was once one of G.D. King Larry Hoover's right-hand men, who ran the campaigns for many Blacks running for office on the south side of Chicago. A few MLDs assisted with the G.D.'s army as a supporter, and Bradley even had them in white campaign shirts. The confidential informant later received word that King Larry Hoover was very impressed with the MLD's assistance. In April 1978, Hoover sat down with leaders of Allied gangs at the State Bill Correction Facility and created the Folk Nation Alliance. Prior to that, his enemies created the People Nation Alliance. So this Folks Nation was a countermeasure to that organization. It was at this meeting where the Latin disciples joined the Folk Nation, since they were already close to Black gangster disciples. The Latinos in this Folk Nation often call themselves Latin Familia, and this involves such gangs as Latin Disciples, Spanish Cobras, Satan Disciples, Imperial Gangsters, Latin Eagles, Ashland Vikings, Orchestra Albany, Ambrose, and the Two Six. The Latin Disciples would work with these gangs, as well as Simon City Royals, to expand their drug empire, as drugs were everywhere in the late 70s and early 80s. But before the folk nation was created, Prince Diablo was no longer in charge, and a new prince was chosen. Ramon Prince Chichi Vasquez took over leadership of the Pee Wees, while original Almighty Latin disciple Jose Freco Sedeno took over running the entire organization. Shortly after Prince Chichi took over the Pee Wees, there were some non affiliated Puerto Rican youth that were being bullied in Logan Square by gay lords, Simon City Royals, and Latin Kings. But the biggest issue was with the Simon City Royals from Christiana and Wellington. These Simon City Royals would attack these neutron youth and beat them up on their way to and back from school just because they were Puerto Rican. One of the youths that was bullied was named Karate Chino, and he was known to be very tough, only he and his friends were outnumbered. So these youth reached out to Prince Chichi and asked to become a new Latin disciple section. Prince Chichi gave them their blessing, and the Logan Square Maniac Latin Disciples were born at Kitsi and Barry in 1978. This section would go on to become one of the toughest MLDs turfs anywhere. Shortly after that happened, Prince Chichi was shot and killed in 1978 by a member of the Insane and Gnomes named Miguel Vargas. Vargas was arrested for the crime and tried in juvenile court. The younger Latin disciples were infuriated over the killing of their prince, and so they went to full-scale war with the Insane and Gnomes. The older maniac Latin disciples, run by Prince Freckles Sedeno, were running dope operations, thanks to the connections of fellow Latin disciple Hugo Juice Herrera who had ties to the notorious Herrera drug cartel family, which was eventually busted in October of 1979. Juice was a Latin disciple from Kenzie and Barry in Logan Square, not from Rockwell and Potomac, even though the drug bust took place in the Twilight Zone. In 1979, Spanish Cobras and Latin disciples both agreed to create and divide their areas and categorize themselves as maniac Latin disciples and insane Spanish Cobras, as well as associated groups in the Maniac or Insane category. It was at this time in the late 70s that Maniac allies began also calling themselves Maniac. Gangs such as Milwaukee Kings, Latin Jivers, Latin Lovers, and Latin Stylers. While several Insane groups aligned with the Cobras, as I described in the Spanish Cobras episode. On the 4th of July 1979, Sedena was arrested for running a major drug ring in cooperation with the Spanish Cobras. 18 members of both gangs were arrested, but Prince Freckles was able to restart his operation months later and was able to run it until the summer of 1980. 
By the summer of 1980, Drug Enforcement Agency and the Chicago Police Organized Crime Unit closed in on other MLD drug operations. But basically, the cops just flushed them out, so they started dealing in other areas. Nevertheless, 46 people were arrested during the bust, and 17 were later arrested. It was said that at the time that you could get any drug you wanted at Rockwell and Potomac, and that cars were literally lined up waiting to get their drugs. In 1980, a ranking incarcerated maniac Latin disciple named Victor King Vic Gomez and Imperial gangster leader Ronald Mad Dog Carrasquillo drew up a constitution to govern Latin folks behind walls. This eventually got approval by Larry Hoover and several other leaders and became an alliance that became known as the Spanish Gangster Disciples, or La Tabla. The Spanish was for Spanish Cobras, Gangster for Imperial Gangsters, and Disciples for Maniac Latin Disciples. These three groups were the main nucleus of La Tabla, but there were other gangs involved. After Freckles went to prison, a new leader emerged out of the streets to take control of the MODs. This would be 19-year-old Fernando Prince Bernie Zayas. Zayas would pick up where Sedano left off and expanded the MOD empire and sold even more drugs. Prince Fernie wanted to let the insane knowns that he did not forget about Ramon Prince Chichi Vasquez, and he even had a tattoo on his left hand that said, Chichi, rest in peace. On July 1st, 1983, Zayas and his friends were partying up when they got word that Miguel Vargas was in the area, hanging out with friends, on the porch watching TV late at night. Zayas, recalling that Vargas, then 15 years old, had shot and killed Prince Chichi, plotted revenge. It was on that night that Zayas and Jose Baby Rodriguez and two others borrowed a car and pulled up to some apartments on West Catalpa in the Anderson section of Edgewater, where they saw Vargas sitting with two friends, Ruben Gutierrez and Luis Quaresma. Zayas and one of his friends got out of the car and fired several shots at the three on the porch. Miguel Vargas was killed, along with one other, and the third one died at a nearby hospital. This is all documented in The People vs. Zayas, 1989. At first, Prince Fernie thought he got away with the killing, but about a month later, witnesses started coming forward and said that they either saw Zayas do the killing or heard him brag about it, which all led to him being arrested by August 1983. He was convicted for those murders in the Illinois Department of Corrections, but incarceration did not stop Prince Fernie from running the disciples from behind walls. He felt he was still the prince of the MLDs, and for the first time, the gang on the streets was being controlled by a leader from the inside. Eventually, although many honored Fernie's claim to the throne, he became forgotten about. Many youngsters today don't even know who he is. Since that time, there's been a lot of turmoil in the MLD organization, as most MLD branches have broken away from Fernie's control, and several factions even feuded against each other. Prince Fernie also got into trouble when he resisted Larry Hoover's attempts over the Spanish Gangster Disciples and how it was run. As the 1980s progressed, the Latin Disciples grew in size, so there was less control. They spread their influence outside of the East and West Humboldt Park, opening up territory, but their strongest sections would still be Rockwell and Potomac and Tom and Bonsia. By 1987, younger Spanish Cobras and Latin Disciples did not get along as well as previous older members did. Eventually, fistfights would break out, which escalated into gunfire. Pretty soon, it was an all-out war. It is said that about 1987, because of all these conflicts with the Maniac Latin Disciples, the Spanish Cobras discontinued their use of the pitchfork as a symbol, which was associated with Maniac Latin Disciples. The Cobras would also end up in a major conflict with fellow allies, the Latin Eagles, starting on the night of September 9th, 1989 when the Eagles threw a party at the Caguas nightclub, which was located on West North Avenue in the Logan Square neighborhood at the time. The Eagles invited Spanish Cobras, Latin Disciples, and Campbell Boys. But as the night went on, a fight broke out between the Latin Eagle and Spanish Cobra, and eventually somebody pulled a gun and started firing. The crowd panicked and ran outside, where a massive brawl resulted and ended up in the death of a Latin Eagle named Little Rook. It is said that he was beaten to death by two by fours. After this death, the Latin Eagles and Spanish Cobras went to war, which put a big dent in the coalition. And by 1992, insane and maniac gangs, mainly the Cobras and Disciples, were going at it. And in spite of peace attempts, 
by some people, it looks like that war will never end. Then the issue reignited when another MOD shot and killed another IG. And so the IGs threatened total war if the MODs did not turn over the shooter. The MODs refused, and this started a very nasty war between MODs and Imperial gangsters. In 1993, three female MOD gang members stood trial for the May 12, 1992 killings of Jimmy Cruz and Hector Reyes, both aged 22, who belonged to the rival Latin Kings. Authorities said that Cruz and Reyes were killed to avenge the death of Ismael Torres, a member of the MODs. The case was unusual because it is uncommon for female gang members to get revenge by killing male members of rival gangs. The group was in Humboldt Park near this bathroom when Reyes said he had to use the restroom. This case was shocking to some because Jackie Montanez allegedly admitted to police that she had been kissing Reyes at the bathroom stall just seconds before she fired a gunshot into his head. It is said that the three suspects celebrated the killings by getting drunk and using drugs. Chicago police said that Montanez had been promoted to lead her area's group of the female D's the day Cruz and Reyes were killed. She and the two others then went on a mission to shoot some Latin kings as revenge for the murder of their friend. Originally, they had planned to shoot any Latin kings they saw on the street, but they saw no one until they saw Cruz in a car with Reyes. The three showed respect by flashing gang signs in order to fool them, indicating that they were the same gang as Cruz and Reyes were. The five then agreed to go to Humboldt Park. Police actually arrested Jackie Montanez as she left Ismael Torres' funeral. During trial proceedings, Montanez stated on film, Maniac KK, to mean Maniac Latin Disciple, Latin King Killer. Then she threw up the pitchfork signs of the gang. It should be noted that on April 8, 2020, Marilyn Mulero walked out as a free woman after spending more than 26 years in prison. Her co-defendant actually had admitted to both killings. Defense advocates claim former detectives Reynaldo Guevara and Ernest Halverson intimidated and interrogated her for more than 20 hours, which produced a false confession. On August 9, 2022, Mulero's conviction was reversed, and state's attorney Kim Fox dismissed the charges against her. She was the 190th person to be exonerated from death row in the United States. The MODs also got into it with the Spanish Cobras in the early 90s, when the MODs accused the Cobras of selling them bad drugs, and a lot of gunplay resulted as a result of the bad deal. During this 1992 war, things between the Insanes and Maniacs got really bad, and this continued into 1993, when some of the Insanes, Spanish Cobras, YLO Cobras, Insane Campbell Boys, and Insane Dragons threw a party. The DJ was playing music that night and the dance floor was full of young people while everybody was drinking and enjoying themselves. But as the night progressed, MODs from Thomas and Washtenaw, also referred to as Burnertown MODs, heard about the party and crashed it. They began waving pistols in the air, showing them off and becoming real cocky. And since they were not invited, this was felt as being very disrespectful by the insanes. Soon, several members of the Spanish Cobras, YLO Cobras, Insane Dragons, and Campbell Boys gathered with guns on one side of the street, while Maniac Latin Disciples, YLO Disciples, Maniac Campbell Boys, and Latin Jivers gathered on the other side of the street. Both sides were hurling insults at each other, and it said that there were about 150 gang members on each side, totaling 300 in total. The insults resulted in gunfire, and several people were shot that night but I'm not sure that any were killed. But in the fall of 1993, the MLDs gunned down Fred Dog of the Insane Campbell Boys. The MLDs had stalked him before the shooting and knew exactly what streets he would pass by in the morning, so they planned it all out. After this shooting, the Insane Campbell Boys retaliated by shooting two MLDs dead. Then the MLDs retaliated by killing Sonny Boy and the Insane Dragons. It is said that they opened up Sonny Boy's window to his bedroom and shot him while he slept. After all these shootings, some of the older guys in the neighborhood and community groups tried to get the insanes and maniacs to agree to a peace treaty. But the shootings continued, and so the peace treaty was disbanded. Shootings continued in 1994 and 1995 between insane Spanish Cobras and Maniac Latin Disciples. Each time that there was a rash of shootings, intervention workers tried to get them to stop, and this often worked temporarily. It is said that 
Rick Dog and Johnny Local were moving a lot of drugs, even surpassing headquarters at Rockwell Potomac. Johnny Local started off as a very dedicated MLD Pee MLD leaders asked Rick Dog and Johnny Local for a bigger cut, but this was turned down. The Bum Brothers became very jealous of Rick Dog's operation and felt cheated and felt that Rick Dog should be paying more tribute. So the Bums began to conspire in secret against Rick Dog. But they knew that the head of La Tabla, Prince Fernie Zayas, would not approve of the removal of Rick Dog. In fact, it was Prince Fernie who put Rick Dog in power. The Bums then began to supply Prince Fernie with all the drugs he needed to get high while behind bars. It is said that Prince Fernie became addicted and the Bums made it worse. Many of the younger MODs then called Prince Fernie a dope fiend and not fit to run their nation. Therefore, he was expelled from leadership and kicked off La Tabla. Now that the Bums had been successful in compromising Prince Fernie, their next step was for the removal of Rick Dog. Shortly after, Enrique Rick Dog Garcia was gunned down by fellow MOD member Jamie Tuffy Ruiz during an internal war. All hell was breaking out on the streets in the mid-90s. Enrique Garcia was shot dead in the driver's seat of his car when a gunman pulled up and shot him dead. It was the first time that an MOD prince had been killed by fellow gang members. It is said that there were over 1,000 attendees at Garcia's funeral. Light blue and black flowers were shaped into pitchforks and were used at the service, and gang members tossed several guns into Garcia's casket as it lowered. Jaime Ruffy Ruiz from the Bums was said to have killed Rick Dog, but he was released pending trial. He was not free for very long, but he was gunned down also by an MLD shooter. Talman and Wabanzia was being fought over by both Cobras and MLDs because this corner brought in a lot of money from drug sales. It was at this time when the MLDs decided that they were not going to let the Cobras do any more business there. It was on this day that Don Loco held a meeting with fellow MLDs to revenge for several deaths of his members and also to show the Spanish Cobras not to mess with Talman and Wabanzi. He and his cohorts declared all-out war against the Spanish Cobras after a high-ranking MOD was shot in Humboldt Park. He and MODs met at a house on Thomas and Washington. It is said that the meeting was attended by about 30 of the top leaders for the MLDs, who said that this meeting was mandatory, so if you missed it, there would be hell to pay. So everybody showed up. A local Omodobar said he wanted to take it to the Cobras, and he wanted every Cobra in that area to be dead. He even set up three hit teams of assassins and picked ones he thought were the best shooters. Weapons were chosen, and the shooters were instructed to dress in all black, black pants, black hoodies, black ski mask, the whole nine yards. The local order for the shootings to happen around 5 p.m. when it was getting dark, so witnesses would have a hard time seeing, but the shooters could still see their targets. This was also shift change for the closest East Humboldt Park Chicago Police Station, and it also was rush hour, so traffic would slow down, as would police and ambulance tenders. Here's a lesson for you police officers, and you and corrections already know also, that often these guys will plan things at the end of shift or the beginning of shift, because they know that there's a lot of chaos. A lot of people are at the police station or in the roll call room and not yet ready for duty or already checked out mentally to get off shift. So the plan was carefully devised when Team 1 shot at three Cobras, hitting one of them in the hip and another in the neck, but both of those victims survived. The next hit team shot a Cobra as he tried to flee and then got on top of him and shot him twice in the head, which left the Cobra blind for the rest of his life. The third team struck and wounded another Cobra, but once again, nobody was killed. So here, it was all planned out. Multiple victims, but nobody killed, which means lots of living witnesses. Now, gangs aren't supposed to talk, but let me tell you, they all talk, given the right conditions. It is said that snitches get stitches, but really the name of the game is don't get caught snitching. And a lot of these guys will do what they call dry snitching. Let me give you an example. So you name a name or show a picture of a, a suspect assailant. They won't say his name or talk about him, but they'll stare at that picture. So that's how you know that's who it was and probably who you already thought it was. Don't, don't get it twisted. Gangs do the same thing. We give away signals too to them. They're very good at reading body language and also very good at getting counterintelligence and pick up things just like our reactions to what they say. So it goes both ways. In 1996, the MOD's second command 
or Don, Johnny Loco Almodovar was arrested on murder charges. With Enrique Garcia dead and Johnny Loco locked up, Rick Dog's son, Pimp Daddy, was released from prison and tried to reassert control over the gang. But he was only able to lead his own faction as the bum faction remained divided as MLD renegades to this very day. There's still some controversy over the true story of the Civil War between both MLD groups, or even which two sections were at war. Some felt the bums didn't kill Rick Dog, but somebody did. Regardless, a civil war erupted within the MLDs between 1996 and 1999. Many MLDs died on both sides of the Civil War. In addition, the War of the Cobras was still on. In 1997, while well, old Cobra shot and killed Omsky from the MLDs in a parking lot on Armitage Avenue. Omsky was putting groceries in his car alongside his wife when Little Miner, a known young Latino organization Cobra, spotted him and gunned him down. Omsky was considered the chief of the Belden and Kenneth chapter of MLDs and supposedly had a run-in with Little Miner previously. Omsky either pistol whipped or shot at Little Miner months prior, so Little Miner sought revenge. And Miguel Morales is in custody for the Delgado murder, a Spanish cobra that lived with Omsky. After Omsky died, Morales got a hold of Omsky's shotgun. It was said to be the same shotgun he used to kill Delgado as a payback on Omsky's anniversary. This sparked the MODs and Spanish cobras into a permanent war that remains today, and that maybe only has a couple of days where they don't shoot at each other, such as maybe the annual Puerto Rican Day Parade. But that is only due to close intervention and supervision by probation and parole, as well as police presence. In the spring of 1999, the Latin disciples and Spanish Cobras decided it was time to end the war and hold a peace conference at the YMCA, located on North Lawndale Avenue in the Logan Square neighborhood. Leaders of both gangs, including MLDs, YLO disciples, Maniac Campbell Boys, and Lyman Styler showed up, as well as leaders of the insane family, such as Spanish Cobras, Wild Old Cobras, National Vikings, Sea Notes, St. Dragons, St. Deuces, Latin Lovers, and Orchestra Albany showed up. Peace was agreed upon, but some MODs felt like the war should not end. A renegade group of MODs, supporters led by Little Bum, did not attend the meeting, instead drove around the meeting and set up soldiers outside the building. When peace was announced, these youngsters began screaming out gang slogans and how they wanted no part of peace. The leaders of the gangs left the meeting in a hurry because they knew that something bad was about to go down. One leader named Carlito got stranded, and as he exited the meeting alone in front of the YMCA, Thomas Outlaw Ross, a member of the MLDs, gunned him down. This brought the end to not only the peace talks, but also for any thought of any Spanish gangster disciple Tabla. In fact, that incident brought about the end of many old-school gangways as we know it today. Outlaw Ross was soon arrested, which put a small dent in his drug ring that spanned a Wicker Park and Bucktown neighborhoods. One of the leading investigators into the MLD's activities at the time in and around in Chicago was none other than my co-author Joe Sparks. He told me that in the late 1990s, we'd have multi-regional gang investigator association meetings dealing with gangs in Chicago and the Burbs. We used to meet every other week or so with the Cook County gang prosecutors and suburban police dealing with gangs. You would have thought that all of Sparks' hard work on the MODs and other gangs and that of other investigators would have been applauded. But instead of focusing on, on putting the bad guys away, some of the brass were out to make a name for themselves. It so happened the case of Chicago PD officer Joseph Miedzinowski. And it's clear that this officer was corrupt. But unfortunately, some people threw the baby out with the bathwater. The gangsters took advantage of the situation. Many cases were thrown out and many good officers' reputations were ruined. Joe himself sat right across the way and many looked at him with suspicion. And it took many years for Joe to clear his name. But I tell you what, and I know Joe would agree, I stood by him the whole time. And I have a lot of other friends that happened to you too. So if you're listening to this, man, I feel for you. It's happened to me. I know a lot of people it's happened to. Unfortunately, sometimes administration is more concerned about their own careers and appeasing the politicians. Now, I'm not saying that there are not some bad officers either, because obviously there are. These individuals should be getting rid of, but one must be careful not to gather up everybody in one swoop, because it's very demoralizing. 
and it's just not good business in the long run. Maybe I'll have a, a panel episode on that in the future. Street cops, jail and prison cops, administrators, and politics. After all, this show is called Gangsters, Cops, and Politicians. Even though Joe was pretty upset about some of this stuff, he also told me some funny stories, like when gangsters would make up their own facts, such as when one LMLD told him, yeah, it's like what the Bible says, what goes around comes around, to try and justify retaliation shootings. Since that time, gang violence in Chicago has gone up and down. And I think Joe would agree, it definitely has increased in parts of the suburbs and has risen again in the Windy City. Joe also told me that the press got it wrong on a guy named Jose Padilla, who was first describing the media as being a Latin king. No, Joe told me this guy was an MLD. Jose Padilla was known as the Dirty Bomb. Joe told me he ran under a guy named Ringo first, then under Chino D, who was tight with Fernie Zayas. Padilla was radicalized while doing time in Florida, and he soon became an Al-Qaeda supporter. Padilla grew up in the Logan Square neighborhood in Chicago, and while growing up, his nickname was Pucho because of his chubby cheeks. It was said as a youngster that he was very kind and polite, but people change. In his early teens, Padilla joined Maniac Latin Disciples, and when he was 14, him and several friends assaulted and robbed three men. When one victim gave chase to them, one of the boys stabbed him in the stomach, according to court records. But he helped the boy throw the man to the ground and kicked the robbed victim in the head. The pair took cash from the victim's pockets and left him in the alley, where he later died. Padilla was convicted of aggravated battery and armed robbery and went into juvenile detention until he was 18 years old. He then went on to create a rap sheet, ranging from assault to unlawful carrying of a weapon to even the low-level crime of attempted theft of a donor. He swiped at cops with knives, fists, and feet. In October 1991, he and his family moved to South Florida, where he was arrested for firing a 38 cal revolver at another driver during a road rage incident. Padilla was released from jail in late 1992. But it is said while he was in jail, he was exposed to Islam, and he converted. So Padilla began a 10-year odyssey, getting closer and closer to radical elements within Islam. But he illegally changed his name to Ibrahim. He married his girlfriend, who also converted. But he started wearing Arab-style dress. In 1998, he left his wife, he left for Egypt, telling friends that he went there to learn Arabic. But actually what happened was he was sponsored by friends, and he began to become more and more radicalized. He moved to Pakistan, where many militants supporting al-Qaeda lived. It was there that he married the widow of a jihadist. He then planned to put together a dirty bomb, said U.S. officials. He traveled to Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq. And on his return to the United States, he was arrested by U.S. Customs agents at Chicago's O'Hare Airport on May 8, 2002, on a material witness warrant issued by the state of New York stemming from the September 11, 2001 attacks on the Twin Towers. President George Bush issued an order to Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld to detain Padilla as an enemy combatant. Padilla was transferred to a military brig in Charleston, South Carolina, using a legally justified order on the 9-11 Authorization of Use of Military Force Joint Resolution, the opinion that a U.S. citizen detained on U.S. soil can be classified as an enemy combatant if there is probable cause. On August 16, 2007, after a day and a half of deliberations, a jury found Padilla guilty on all counts. He was then sentenced on January 22, 2008, to 17 years and four months in federal prison. Most MLDs today denied that he was ever an MLD or have since disowned him. I included the story on Padilla because today the MLDs remain street terrorists in their neighborhoods. While they may have started out as a protection group with intentions of helping out their neighborhood back in the mid-1960s, for many years since, they have engaged in preying on their neighborhoods and hurting people who live there. Maybe some of you MLDs will think about all the death and destruction you've caused and go back to your true roots to help La Gente de Chicago and other areas you may go. Think about it. What do you want your legacy to be? In addition to thanking all of our cop friends in the greater Chicago area, and all of the great guys and gals from the Chicago PD gang unit, I'd like to give a special shout out to Franco Doma from the Cook County Jail, who was taught from me before in Chicago and is a top-notch senior gang intelligence investigator. 
who gave me some great feedback on this episode and several others. Thank you, brother. I hope that you learned from this episode and that you come back to view many more. We're almost done with Latino gangs, but I'll cover a few more before we move on to other gangs in the Windy City. Thanks once again to ChicagoGangHistory.com for your well-done research on these gangs. Don't forget to purchase your copy of Chicago-based gangs, Beyond Folks and People, written by myself and Joe Sparks, retired Chicago Police Department gang detective. Our book can be purchased on Amazon.com and other platforms, and it can be ordered from any major bookstore. As always, please take care of each other and stay safe. Until next time, this is Gabe Morales signing off, Gangsters, Cops, and Politics.